tonight I'll be reading Sir Arthur Conan Doyle's The Adventures of Sherlock Holmes, The Copper Beaches. This will be a multi-episode series. Eventually it will be one complete playlist, but for the moment I'll be releasing an episode once a week, maybe more, until the series is complete. Let's begin. To the man who loves art for its own sake, remarked Sherlock Holmes, tossing aside the advertisement sheet of the Daily Telegraph. It is frequently in its least important and loneliest manifestations that keenest pleasure is to be derived. It is pleasant for me to observe, Watson, that you have so far grasped this truth and these little records of our cases, which you have been good enough to draw up, and, I am bound to say, occasionally to embellish. You have given prominence not so much to the many cause celebre and sensational trials in which I have figured, but rather to those incidents which may have been trivial in themselves, but to which have given room for those faculties of deduction and of logical synthesis which I have made my special province. And yet, said I, smiling, I cannot quite hold myself absolved from the charge of sensationalism, which has been urged against my records. You have erred, perhaps. He observed, taking up a glowing cinder with the tongs and the lighting with its long, cherry wood pipe, which was wont to replace his clay when he was in a disputatious rather than a meditative mood. You have erred, perhaps, in attempting to put color and life into each of your statements instead of confining yourself to the task of placing upon record that severed reasoning from the cause to effect which is really the only notable feature about the thing. It seems to me that I have done you full justice in the matter, I remarked with some coldness, for I was repelled by the egotism, which I had more than once observed to be a strong factor in my friend's singular character. No, it is not selfishness or conceit, said he, answering, as was his wont, my thoughts rather than my words. If I claim full justice for my art, it is because it is an impersonal thing, a thing beyond myself. Crime is common. Logic is rare. Therefore, it is upon the logic rather than upon the crime that you should dwell. You have degraded what should have been a course of lectures into a series of tales. It was a cold morning of the early spring, and we sat after breakfast on either side of a cheery fire in the old room at Baker Street. A thick fog rolled down between the lines of dun-colored houses, and the opposing windows loomed like darkness. Shapeless blurs through the heavy yellow wreaths. Our gas was lit and shone on the white cloth and glimmer of china and metal, for the table had not been cleared yet. Sherlock Holmes had been silent all the morning, dipping continuously into the advertisement columns of a succession of papers until at last, having apparently given up his search, he had emerged in no very sweet temper to lecture me upon my literary shortcomings. At the same time, he remarked after a pause, during which he had sat puffing at his long pipe and gazing down into the fire. You can hardly be open to a charge of sensationalism, for out of these cases which you have been so kind as to interest yourself in, a fair proportion do not treat of crime in its legal sense. At all. The small matter in which I endeavored to help the King of Bohemia, the singular experience of Miss Mary Sutherland, the problem connected with the man with the twisted lip, and the incident of the noble bachelor were all matters which are outside the pale of the law. But in avoiding the sensational, I fear that you may have bordered on the trivial. The end may have been so, I answered, but the methods I hold to have been novel and of interest. Pshaw, my dear fellow, what do the public, the great unobservant public, who could hardly tell a weaver by his tooth or a compositor by his left thumb, care about the finer shades of analysis and deduction? But, indeed, if you are trivial, I cannot blame you, for the days of the great cases are past. Man, or at least criminal man, has lost all enterprise and originality. As to my own little practice, it seems to be degenerating into an agency for recovering lost lead pencils and giving advice to young ladies from boarding schools. I think that I have touched bottom at last, however. This note I had this morning marks my zero point, I fancy. Read it. He tossed a crumpled letter across to me. It was dated from the Montague place upon the preceding event and ran thus. Dear Mr. Holmes, 
I am very anxious to consult you as to whether I should or should not accept a situation which has been offered to me as governess. I shall call at half past ten tomorrow if I do not inconvenience you. Yours faithfully, Violet Hunter. Do you know the young lady? I asked. Not I. It is half past ten now. Yes, and I have no doubt that is her ring. It may turn out to be more of interest than you think. You remember that the affair of the blue carbuncle, which appeared to be a mere whim at first, developed into a serious investigation? It may be so in this case also. Well, let us hope so. But our doubts will very soon be solved, for here, unless I am much mistaken, is the person in question. As he spoke, the door opened and a young lady entered the room. She was plainly but neatly dressed, with a bright, quick face, freckled like a plover's egg, and with the brisk manner of a woman who has had her own way to make in the world. This concludes this episode of The Copper Beaches. Stay tuned for the next episode.